I think people have funny bones and it is people can say funny things or, or they can do funny things. Um, and if it's not there, it's not there. I don't think, uh, I, I know it's quite fashionable to say anybody can dance and anybody can sing, but if you haven't got a decent singing voice in the first place, you're, you know, you're not going to start the Coliseum. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humor. Humorology is the study of how humor can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a renowned medical doctor and the founder of the Premier Medical Group. Throughout his career, he has sat at the head of many boardrooms as chairman of companies such as Personal Injury Forum at Booper, RTA Limited and Curo Healthcare, just to name a few. In addition to leadership in the business boardroom, you can also find him as the chairman of Lansing College, fellow of the Woodard Corporation, a council member of Southwark Cathedral Development Trust and the chairman of the English National Opera. In addition to his contributions to medicine and business, he is known for his funny bone, including performing as a stand-up while studying to be a doctor. His talks are captivating and comedy-ridden, leaving audiences and the likes of Tommy Steele and Sir Tim Rice cackling in his wake. The only thing more impressive than his list of titles and accomplishments are his glorious gifts for the game of golf. Dr Harry Brunges, welcome to the Humorology podcast. I'm sure I can follow that. They always say in show business, the hardest thing is to follow yourself, isn't it? <laughs> for that glorious kickoff there i'm all yours oh well it's lovely to have you here harry i'm really pleased you could take the time firstly i'd like to take you back to the, the early years when you were growing up you were born at, to the sound of song your father was the oldest of three brothers who trod the boards as the singing scott brothers a close harmony doo-wop group music was obviously everywhere but was humour also valued in your family? If you go back to that, uh, the I'm, I'm the fifth Harry Brungers who's had show business, uh, you know, has had comedy in the blood, you know, and uh, what's well, that lovely gag? It's, it's a shame the comedy never reached my act. But the uh, but it's the uh, my my great grandfather was principal flautist for the Scholar Symphony Orchestra. My grandfather was uh, uh, a pianist and played in the silent movies. Uh, my father then became a variety star with his two brothers and the singing Scott brothers. And they started uh, in kilts and tartan jackets in Scotland, but the whole thing spread to England. And they ended up doing summer seasons, so the, big, the big seasons like Blackpool and Bournemouth, Great Yarmouth. And then they did the Royal Variety Show in 1952 at the London Coliseum. So that links in nicely with me being, you know, nearly a decade as chair at the London Coliseum. Uh, and then the reason they really uh, stopped doing that was they were all married with young children, first of all. And then you mentioned Tommy Steele, who's a long term family friend. But with the arrival of Tommy in 56 and Bill Haley in the comments, my father and his two brothers thought, that close knit harmony stuff, Mills Brothers, Inksbox type stuff, wasn't going to sustain. And uh, and then they did, then they they were going to go into Blackpool one summer uh, in 57, 58 with George Formby, but then they decided against it. But if I just before I let you back in, the bit which I thought was rather cheeky was a couple of years later, by which stage all three of them were now school teachers. Uh, they got a phone call from the London office about uh, Sunday concerts at the, the Opera House Blackpool. And the stars were, every Sunday, a big American star like Lena Horne, um, um, 
uh, Johnny Ray, Guy Mitchell, um, God, the guy who was in The Godfather, whose name escapes me, the crooner, uh, come to me in a minute, um, uh, uh, the Deep River Boys, and rather cheekily, not having done anything on stage for two years at that level, they turned up to the opera house and they rehearsed in the afternoon and they opened for Lena Horn and uh, Guy Mitchell. And so that's one of our, our family anecdotes. Wow, that, uh, that's yeah. extraordinary. Well, I mean, obviously song was everywhere and music was everywhere. In those variety acts, was comedy also important? And did that... Uh, a sense of fun, a sense of humour pervade the, the, the family. So they were three brothers. And when they were at their pomp, the ages were, I don't know, 26, 24, 22. And so there was a lot of sibling gags in, on the stage and a lot of messing about, a lot of lighthearted introductions. And then a lot of comedy songs like a uh, comedy version of a number called Donkey Serenade and things like that. So there was there was there was a there was a stack of that, and, and, and was they never did. Uh, none of the three of them actually did us. They did light-hearted. They were good talkers. Uh, they were good spontaneous talkers. They never actually did the sort of naked twelve-minute spot. You and the microphone. They never did that. You know. So it's patter, a bit of patter in between. Yeah, they taught, they taught me the whole patter and all the standard stuff. Yeah. Well, you said they taught you the whole pattern. I mean, so was the young Harry uh, humorous? Uh, I think I was. And uh, then as th then my father ended up uh, as a school teacher in Lowestoft, uh, then he became a headmaster in Bedford in later years. Uh, but for about 10 years, when all the big shows came into Great Yarmouth, my father knew them all. And as a boy, I had the great thrill of standing at the side of the stage, watching Mork and Wise going on. Uh, you know, watching Bruce Forsyth going on. I was only eight, nine or ten, but it was highly influential uh, to stand there at these summer shows and to have all Lenny the Lion, who's a family friend, and, you know, watching them, watching them come on, Sandy Powell, you know, just the little skills which may get onto, the ability, how important it is as an act to be able to walk on and walk off and look as if you know what you're doing. You know, it's most people audiences want people to do well but they can smell as somebody has fear and that walk on to the middle you know ladies and gentlemen harry scott and you walk out and you look as if you mean business and so i was taught all that i watched it and then and then uh, as the years went on and as we may come on to i worked with some of these stars and uh, sandy powell in particular was very helpful and when you say helpful, because a lot of uh, people who listen to this podcast around the world, you know, the, one of their main fears is speaking in public. And you've just <coughs> touched on something uh, I think that is already important. This walk on uh, people buy confidence. And, and, and as somebody who works in psychology, I'm interested, having done it myself, what is that thing that you could say to people how do you walk on and give the the audience a feeling that you are confident it'd be worth your while watching some of the old timers if you watch Norman Wisdom make his entrance you watch Frankie Howard make his entrance uh, I can think and Doddy Doddy worked very fast when he came out but he was a busy bee but it was rehearsed within an inch of his life you know the hat the big furry coat the big tickling stick and it looks as if it was all spontaneous but it was out, stage left tickle, stage right tickle. Uh, how are you, missus? Bend forward, look to the side, all rehearsed. Normal wisdom, come out, pretend to fall. And Jackie, my wife, did a show with them. The pretending to fall bit and tripping up bit, it all looked spontaneous. It was rehearsed like a ballet. Uh, and it's remarkable. If you watch more than Wise, there's, one, there's only one live clipping of theirs, as far as I know, from the Fairfield Halls 50 years ago. Right. And you watch them come out. Uh, Ernie goes first. He comes behind. They walk together. They walk over stage left, take a call, walk over stage right, take a call, then take a ball. To, then they cross over. That all looks as if it's just very natural. It's beautiful stuff. 
So one of the things you touch on there is actually the rehearsal of that. So it's actually very, very clear, you yeah. know, that, that when you come on, you own the stage. I spent 10 years working at the comedy store and I always yeah. say to people, it's about putting everybody else at their ease. So yeah. they go, they've got this. They're in charge. And and you talked about your father and, and uh, his brothers being uh, school teachers and headmasters and, and things. Isn't is that the same thing that that walking in and taking charge? So my father as a headmaster was. Um, he wasn't a disciplinarian, but he had discipline and uh, he used to say uh, uh, the public speaking bit of school teaching is terribly important. You will remember when you're at school, there were teachers who could be five foot tall, but you wouldn't mess around with. And there would be teachers who were six foot six and you wouldn't mess around with. There was just something about their personality that they meant business. And uh, so my father's confidence in public speaking, uh, the school assemblies and all that sort of stuff, he, he, he just had it. And he relates lots of his life, as I do, to these very experiences you've had along the line. Well, I think it's one of the, the the best founding blocks. I mean, you went on to work as a GP before founding the Premier Medical Group. It was, and, and obviously, then you uh, sold your clinics and everything. As a successful businessman, do you think, on the back of what you just said, has humour actually helped with the whole business aspect? I'm, I've done some pretty big negotiations. And uh, when you're closing out on a multi-million pound deal, uh, if anybody ever listens, you know, whoever listens to the podcast, if, if you've done that, I never know why that you've been negotiating due diligence for nine months and yet you're still stuck in a big legal office at 4 a.m. in the morning, arguing the toss and signing, signing it all the way. And then you, you end up arguing over trivia as you get nearer I, I sometimes think it's a psychological thing that people don't want to sign or don't want to close, or the lawyers want to continue making money. But the uh, but you go there at four in the morning, and my technique, and I do it naturally, is to keep chucking in a bit of patter. It gets tense, and somebody will say something stupid, and I will say, "Are you still available for pantomime?" And, uh, <laughs> and I'll I'll do something like that because it gets tense, and you've got to bring people back from the prink. And sometimes they get so tense, they're on the verge of either really losing their temper or making a fool of themselves. And uh, I, I just do it naturally. I, it's, that bit has been so much part of me now. It's preconceived. I don't do it. Well, uh, there's a very interesting social science study. I don't know if you've ever come across it, whereby in negotiation, which you just talked about, they, they found that when people negotiated straight, they didn't get as good a deal as when they used like a words at the end of uh, the negotiation, which were, I'll also throw in my pet frog. Yeah, they do. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and so what it does, I think it just lightens the back and perhaps opens the door uh, and humour opens that door, which is a, an interesting concept. Well, I say things like, you know, if you stick another note on the end of this, you can spend a whole year at my house in Spain playing golf at Alderama. And they go, no, we can't move the price, Dr. Brunches. I said, well, bang goes that, bang goes that year's golf, you know. And uh, I, I listen, some of it, I can't remember. It just comes off the top of my head. It's like ad-libbing. Oh, it is. But uh, do you think that that, that has a marked uh, effect on, on why business people work better when they can ad-lib and they can play with the room as it were well i always like to leave somebody with something i also like to think we'd, we'd do a deal again and maybe it's uh, the insecurity of a comic i like to th i'd like to think they like you a bit that maybe when it's all over you'd have a decent lunch or a dinner anyway because uh, you never know when they come around on the roundabout of life again so i'm i'm not into uh, that sort of wall street michael douglas Fashion them into submission, 
you know, taking them for everything they've got. No, I, I think that. And, it, and it's an interesting thing that I, uh, you, who have been a very, very successful businessman and you're chairman of all kinds of uh, places, still value humour as the difference that makes a difference. And what you just said, what I thought was very interesting, I still think people will do better business with people they like and they trust. Yeah. What do you think about that? Is, well, is that it's, crucial? It's, it's all about people, isn't it? You know, uh, at the end of the day, people do business with people. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you, you know, you don't do business with a balance sheet. You don't do business with a CRM platform. You don't do business with a back office payroll. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I've, I've had this just yesterday. Um, somebody was moaning, uh, I won't say which bank it was, moaning about the bank. God, you can't trust them these days. And in fact, that's not fair on the bank because the only reason you say that is because you've fallen out with the one person on the telephone. And, and because one person in these huge multinational banks doesn't serve you correctly, that then immediately accentuates to being the whole bank is rubbish. And uh, so it's, it's, it's all of that, really. Do you think that as a leader, it's you set the tone for everyone uh, around you because you just talked about sort of one person on the phone you know that can ruin somebody's impression of a whole organization how yeah. incumbent is it on a leader to lead with laughter if you like or lead with well, lightness that, but there there are many ways to lead i personally find with comedy and being light-hearted about it uh, works uh, but the cult the ethics the values, which are, you know, fashionable words these days, the mission and vision comes from the top. It comes from the top, you know. And uh, and it's important not to abuse that power. Uh, I, you can... I, I've got... This is probably not to do with your podcast, but with football clubs in particular, uh, they spin round leaders at a great, a great rate uh, because there is, there is an underlying culture to most of our big, you know, Tottenham Hotspur, Arsenal, Spurs are different. And often when you put big personalities into these big institutionalised clubs, there's immediately a collision between the, the ethics and values of this new personality, uh, both interacting with the long-standing culture of the club. And it doesn't sometimes work. So, so what is the, the way through that then, in your opinion? Oh, that's a different point. As a chair... Uh, there's nothing more important than you do than you hire a chief exec. Uh, so um, when I've hired chief execs in in the West End, I keep pointing because it's just over there, um, West End, or or in education, chair in at Lansing, uh, or in business, I must admit I spend a lot of time on those processes. You know, you only get one chance to make a first impression, and that appointment of a chief chief exec must be right. So, uh, and what are you looking for? How important is humour in that process? Do you, do you have to, I mean, could you um, get a chief exec who was doer and, and didn't have a sense of humour? Or is it something that sways the balance? Well, of... well, well, this is the value judgment. I undoubtedly work better with chief execs who can make me laugh. And of course, it's very sensible for them to laugh at my jokes as well. That goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah but isn't that about uh, getting rapport with people isn't it and if they can get rapport with you presumably the the undercurrent in your mind is well they'll be able to get rapport with the team and and bring people with them rather than you know be an authoritarian yeah well i just think there are some major people we've all know of in life who, if they could have had a light-hearted moment, I don't know, just off the top of my head. Um, let's take Gordon Brown. Well, I don't know why I'm mentioning him this morning, but Gordon Brown, clear intellectual foundation, extremely bright, uh, but a serious man and could be on the on the doer side of life. Um, but on occasions later in later life, and I've seen him interviewed retrospectively or given comment on a current situation, he is he is funny. He is bright, but that never came out when he was leading the Labour Party or the country. 
talking about politicians, um, do you think that that uh, humor and or perceived humor and uh, uh, a, a charisma is now crucial for somebody to actually get there? Because we see what's happening at the moment. Boris Johnson, um, you know, got a 80 seat majority by perce being perceived as that. And now the perception is, which I don't think is true, is that Keir Starmer is a bit dour and is, is a bit straight. Do you think now the public are looking for charismatic, humorous leaders? Well, you've fallen into one of my little after dinner lines. When we had Boris one side and Keir the other, I said, you know, my view, leadership, you have to have swagger and substance. And when Boris was prime minister, I said, we have a prime minister full of swagger, full of swagger, but no substance. And we have a leader of the opposition who's full of substance and no swagger. And uh, that's where I landed on it. And I, I can smell, because I like PM2, so I watch it if I can. He's doing his best here to get a bit more swagger. Uh, but going back to comedy, even though he's a barrister, he doesn't quite get, he doesn't quite time the gags sometimes. And he, he lays them up that, you know, you th it, it's, sometimes they're trailed too much. And, he, and he, he ruins it by over trailing the punchline. He's not, he, he doesn't naturally feel the journey to the punchline sometimes. And he's clearly been taught how to do it. And I bet he's in and out, out studios rehearsing all day long. Well, well that's really interesting because uh, you, you, you with your um, show business roots and show business background, do you think that comedy can be taught or is it an instinct that is uh, within people who hear the beats naturally and are able to, uh, to do it? You know the film Jerry Lewis, Funny Bones? Yes. Lovely line, you know, when he's trying to teach his son comedy and he says, son, uh, some people say funny things, others do funny things. It breaks my heart to say it to you, but you can do neither. Uh, <laughs> it's a lovely scene on the beach when he's, you know, his son is trying to follow his father. I think people have funny bones and it is people can say funny things or, or they can do funny things. Um, and if it's not there, it's not there. I don't think, uh, I, I know it's quite fashionable to say anybody can dance and anybody can sing, but if you haven't got a decent singing voice in the first place, you're, you know, you're not going to start the Colosseum. And uh, and uh, the great dancers who have come strict through strict, you know, once they've done well and won, um, they would still look pretty exposed coming out on stage at the Royal Ballet Company, you know, the Royal Opera House, I think. Um, so I think you've got to have something there. We all have innate talents. You may be the greatest world canoeist, and we don't know it because you haven't done it. You may have an innate skill there, and you don't know it. No, you could oh, well, make more money doing canoes than you could do the, the podcast. You, you may not know that, but this could be a directional moment for you. Oh, well, well I'm, I'm going to take that and, and, and give this and up action, and go as canoeing. An in business. Take that as an action. <laughs> No, it's interesting because uh, when you were talking there, I was thinking we, um, we had William Hague on the uh, on the podcast, who was brilliantly funny at, at, at PMQs. And uh, Alistair Campbell, who we also had on the podcast, was said the only person they feared was William Hague because he was funny. But William Hague categorically on the record said Margaret Thatcher was not funny. She didn't get anything. No. And... and and really just didn't get the gags and didn't have that grounding of, of hearing funny, feeling funny, or whatever it is. So is it just a gift given from God? Well, William, I know William Hague because uh, uh, I sat on the, in my early days at e and I sat on the board with Fionn Hague. She was a fellow board member, so I spent time with him. He clearly is an actual comic and he, he's a well-known after-dinner speaker. And as you know, he became all the rage when he was a funny 14 year old, wasn't he at the conference? And, uh, and he suddenly, uh, no, no, he has comedy. I mean, he has timing. Um, there's a lovely story about Margaret Thatcher, which Charles Moore gives about comedy. They wrote about her lack of knowledge or understanding of it. They wrote a piece. It's when uh, the Labour Party, you know, they changed the, um, the mantra. They had a dub, didn't they? What's, what's the Labour oh, Party? that's right. The, the logo. The, the, yeah. yeah, the bird on it. So the scriptwriters 40 years ago wrote a whole piece for her 
mimicking and plagiarizing the dead parrot sketch uh, from Monty Python. So it was all written out for her and she'd rehearsed it. But it said, I don't think this about the dead parrot's funny. I don't think it's funny. They said, oh, Prime Minister will work. You just pause there, hold there, do the comparison with dead parrot. It will land. That is funny. She goes, well, if you say it, I'll go out and do it. And she was standing in the wings at the Bournemouth conference, again, still worried about the dead parrot. And then she said to the scriptwriters, this fellow Monty Python, is he one of us? <laughs> she had no idea who Monty Python was. I said, Charles Moore dines out on that. Oh, this fellow dear. Monty Python, anyway, there you are. Oh, we're, we're going down that, that road. What makes you laugh, Harry? I see Max Wall on your wall behind you, so I'm presuming that he's one of them. There he is. So uh, after my early days with my father, then uh, when I was at school, at the age of 14, I started work as a Butlin redcoat. So I did, I did three years as a redcoat, and I got into a thing which was very big business. I got into the redcoat show, which then I travelled around all the... Mineheads and the Filies and the Bogners and the Clactons and did all the uh, all the counts. So what made me laugh then? Uh, it, it was fabulous, really. I mean, there I was doing science O levels and science A levels, and then seeing all this uh, Easter holidays and summer holidays. Uh, I just loved the nonsense of the. I love what some of the corny old routines, and of course, when you travelled with them. You knew their acts back to front because they were word perfect. They had a 14 minute routine and it was just like turning a record on. It was just, and, and so I lo- and then I loved the bits where it went wrong. Um, but as I was watching all that, uh, I did love Monty Python. I did love Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. Um, uh, and people often used to say, I'm a pianist. People say to me, who's, who's the greatest pianist? And I say the greatest unsung pianist in my view is Dudley Moore, uh, and the greatest unsung horn player is Roy Castle, because they were known for other things. Yeah. Although they were brilliant musicians, people don't quite remember them for being brilliant musicians, you know, whereas Dudley Moore could have spent his whole life playing at Ronnie Scott's, and uh, Roy Castle could have sat in a pro band his whole life playing horn. He was, he was fabulous. But when I was watching them, I got, when, I loved all that on TV, but I, I got more seduced by watching these traditional musical comics from the side. And I never saw Max Miller, but I saw Trinder a lot. I saw Max, who I knew, Stax. Uh, and then the other comics at the time, uh, the young Jimmy Tarbuck, I saw lots of. Uh, a double act I worked with, you may or may not remember, called Hope and Keen who I thought were very good at knockabout comedy. Um, uh, uh, Sandy Powell, the comedian I loved, uh, used to watch a lot of Bob Monkhouse. Um, but I suppose my favourite uh, uh, was Max Wall. He had every trick in the book and every line in the book, every pause, a wonderful entrance, a wonderful entrance on the stage. And, and he's had two routines, one with the tights when he did Professor Woloski, then the other one when he just came on in a suit with a trilby. And it was just the pace of it and a wonderful opening. I, so you mentioned so many people there. I mean, they are all of a certain era. Is there anyone in uh, more recent times that you think has held a candle to them? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I mean, Billy Connolly was in a class of his own. Yeah, um, um, Eddie Izzard does a most bizarre stand-up. Uh, I mean, he's got such intelligence. Um, and he's brave because he sometimes disappears down a stream of consciousness. Whereas most comics will disappear down somewhere and will want to close, you know, and say, the vicar said, you know. But Eddie will go down somewhere. And if it peters out, he doesn't bother. I've known Eddie for so long, uh, uh, since he first started. And, and uh, I would say there's a, a word I always say about uh, uh, Eddie is brave. He's yeah. extraordinarily brave because he doesn't mind going down those rabbit holes, but he, he's got enough confidence to know that he can find his way out. He's extremely good like that. 
the one who interests me, of course, uh, uh, is is Peter Kay is an astonishing talent. But interest, I, I compare him with Billy, who I only met once. You know, Billy did start as the archetypal Scotch comedian, dressing up in the outfit with the big banana boots on, and it was all very, uh, it was all very Scottish and things. But he moved away from that, and he moved first of all to England and then to the States and then would stand up in a jeans and a T-shirt and talk about anything. You know, Peter Kay's enormous. I mean, he's going to make a fortune out of the O2 next year. And yet he hasn't, in a way, he's still on the northern Bolton man, isn't he? You know, and, and I suppose I think he, I mean, he could just move away from that. People who listen to this podcast are obviously, well, obviously we do get quite a lot of comics because mm -hmm. I, I know them, but mainly it's people <laughs> in business but who um, want to know what you're a great after dinner speaker. You, you do it. What do you think your advice to anybody who's standing up to speak should be? Is it, you know, only use humor if you're sure it will work or get, allow the humor to come. What, what do you think that uh, normal people in inverted commas who just have to get up and speak, what do you think, that key nugget that you would give them is? If you're not funny and being funny, trying to be funny terrifies you, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't, number one. Uh, if you've been asked to speak, first of all, uh, be nice. You know, uh, be nice. You know, um, if you're going to be funny, that's a bonus. If you can't do it, don't kill yourself. Don't try. And if you, I see so many people, I can see in these after dinner routines, they're getting into a gag, a gag I know, they're rushing for the punchline, they can't pace it. Then they, and I can see their faces drop when it, when it don't, doesn't land and they think, don't do it. I mean, I, well, I would love to. I don't try and play football for Tottenham Hotspur. You know, I can't do it. So, so, so don't, if you're not funny, don't do it. If you, if, that's the first thing. Uh, second thing is um, don't overstretch. If, 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 if you're going out for the early time, don't try and do 25 minutes. Do eight minutes. Don't, you know, 25 minutes, can I tell you, with a mic in your hand is a long time. And so uh, do eight minutes. Do six minutes and just makes a good six minutes. And one of my lines, another one, I've got loads of this stuff. You can get me talking about this all day long. Uh, spontaneity is all about rehearsal. And rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and have a very good start. Don't get up and get, you, get that opening line. It sounds silly, but good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invite. Just get that very clear. None of that is funny, but it looks as if you're confident. And confidence sells, doesn't it, and in so any field? Just get your start and have your finish and have the finish. And the finish is either genuine, it's about you, or it could be something to do with whatever sector you're in, or if it's a, if it's a nice story. Um, many, many, again, many, there was a period when I was doing after dinner speaking, when in fact, it's gone out of fashion, you'd be picking on someone in the audience, you know, thank you, sir, I was gonna do an impression of an idiot tonight, but you've just beaten me to it, you know, and you, you could do all that stuff, but that's gone now. If you're gonna do anything like that, it's self-deprecating. So, you know, so I will stand up and say, what a great pleasure for you. Thank you so much for tolerating me. Uh, uh, before I became chair of English National Opera, I was six foot six with long brown hair. Now look what's happened. And, but, you know, nice stuff against yourself. I would do that. So, so you talk about self-deprecation. Uh, do you think it's important, not just on stage, but in life and in business to be able to laugh at yourself? Yeah, I think, yeah, you have got to laugh at yourself. And um, if you laugh at yourself, then they like it. And actually, if you take the mickey out, everybody's there in boardrooms, it's all quite alpha. But if you say something about yourself, you know, being small or bald, whatever it is, if you do that, that actually, they find that that takes them off guard. That takes them off guard. Do you find that that's more of a British thing? Because, I mean, having lived in America and, and seen it there, they seem less uh, inclined to go the self-deprecation route. And, and do you have to adjust 
um, depending on who the audience is. Yeah. I mean, in I mean, I've done a lot of business in Hong Kong as well, and and the states. Uh, the states is all speak and all algorithms, and we must close out here before the fall, and they're all talking like that. And Hong Kong, of course, it's all very charming, extremely graceful, uh, exchanging cards. And in fact, if you come in with the comedy, uh, they don't like it because they don't understand it. You certainly can't do British comedy there. Ameri American comedy is very different as well. Uh, uh, and it's horses. For, I mean, I, I wouldn't go out. I mean, I've done a lot of after dinner speeches in Hong Kong. Now, I wouldn't go out to Hong Kong Football Club and do my old, my old material from Great Yarmouth. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be foolish. Well, uh, that, that takes me to uh, another place, because what you're describing to me is the importance of listening to a room. Well, you get me on to another one of my st stories. I, um, I qualified as a medic in 1980. I was five years a junior surgeon between Guy's Hospital and the Royal Sussex County Hospital. And then I spent five or six years as a general practitioner. And then I used to train younger general practitioners coming through. And I used to say, well, let, let me do this. Let's, let's say you're a medical student. Now, there's another career for you. I would say to you, Paul, as a doctor, what's the most important thing you do with a patient? What do you think the answer is? Uh, listen to them. Correct. Now, they all get that wrong, junior doctors. They all say, make a diagnosis. They all say, do a blood test. They all say examination. And I say, just listen to them. Can I tell you, if you listen, you'll have the diagnosis even before they're on the couch. And uh, just listen to them. I'm slightly cheating here because uh, I, I spent two and a half years training doctors in communication at Guy's, uh, King's and St. Thomas's. So um, uh, I, I kind of get it. But one of the things I found with doctors is that the hardest thing to teach them uh, was to listen and to actually um, be in the room with people. The amount of people um, I found who were looking at their laptop or their computer rather than at the patient was remarkable to me. And what I used to do uh, in those days, if somebody came in with an esoteric rare illness, I would send them off to the professor whose faculty, whose discipline that was. And I used to say, look, you're going to go and see Professor Smith, brain the size of a planet. Trust me, it's the right person to see. But having said that, once you've seen him, come back and see me and I'll translate for you. You know, <laughs> and I'll explain what he was talking about because they go straight into speech. But the condition you have, Mrs. Johnson, the osmotic transfer of the O2 molecule across the alveolar membrane is competing with the actual CO2 uh, a componency on the hemoc and they just go into that and of course and people, people nod away you know because they think they're in front of some but they come they come out even more confused and not satisfied i saw that happen so many times and, and what people uh, doctors don't realize is that that people go into altered states when they're in front of a, a, a doctor yeah. or a medical professional so they they get more confused and the first thing they hear that they can uh, latch onto is the thing that they believe is true you know uh, and and a doctor could say something like, uh, "Oh yes, people who've had your condition, some only lived uh, six months, um, but you're uh, young, healthy, and fit." But they will just hear six months. Come out and go. I've got six months to live, and it's very, very. It's how you say it. It's the uh, well. It's it's how it's it's like comedy, isn't it? It's it's how well, you deliver you it. Talk, you can talk to them for an hour. The only word they'll remember is cancer. And uh, so you've, you've got to be, again, you've got to use that. And again, over the years, having, having been on stage, having had a very open family relationship, having done all that red coat work um, and holiday camp stuff, uh, and then having been on, you know, on the theatre tour, I just learned lots of things to say and saying, saying the right things at the right time. That, and it's instinct. But you talk about coming on stage, you know, when, you used to, when I used to take my entrance, ladies and gentlemen, and I'd come out, do all that. It's the same used to come and see me in Harley Street. I don't care who it was, whether it was Lord Haw or us, don't be absolutely consistent, treat everybody exactly the same. Get up, 
meet them at the door, shake their hand, sit them down. You know, I hope I didn't keep you waiting. Now, how can I help you today? And, uh, you know, the word help is important, for example. I just tell them, say help, because they are there for help. Yes. And, and, uh, and again, to me, that was a bit of an act, really. You know, up, next patient, press the bell, go and meet them. If I was running fluently and not being not tight on the time, it didn't always work because of the pressure of patients. I'd actually go and pick them in the, out of the waiting room, go and get them. Brilliant, because it's an entrance, isn't it? Yeah. And it's yeah. uh, and already you're creating rapport between yeah. you and yourself. And you just said it earlier on. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. No, oh, I know, I know. And and that's uh, you've just shown why that's so important. And I thank you for that. If I asked you to write a business case for humour, Harry, what would you include in it? If there was to be humour in the workplace, I think uh, you would bring, it sounds rather trite, but you would bring happiness. And I think people would be happier. It's not a struggle to come to work. Uh, I don't like, I don't, uh, people know I'm running these things. Uh, there's no need to keep reinforcing you're the boss. And I like to be approachable. Um, so I think humour and happiness are important core things to any institution, whether it's a business or a school or an institution. Uh, let's take London Coliseum. I've been there the best part of a decade. Uh, I have a great relationship with the chief exec. I also have a great relationship with, with Mick on the stage door. I also have a great relationship with Mohammed, who's in charge of security. And, uh, and um, they're all very charming to me. We have lovely exchanges. I found out what they like to talk about. And Mohammed likes to talk about London. Mick likes to talk about Tottenham Hotspur. And, uh, and it just makes it very, very happy. And sometimes uh, I may need something done very quickly. Uh, I know because I'm close to Mick on stage, I can phone him. And no problem, doctor. Leave it with me. I'll get it sorted. And it just works. That's really interesting uh, from a, a man who, you know, <laughs> is chair at the EN and the O and all those things that you are still aware that it's all about the relationships, isn't it? And there was a, uh, a really interesting study in America that concluded that 85 percent of all your success in life is down to the quality of your relationships. And I think when you're talking to Mohammed or whoever, yeah. you are using humour and lightness of touch, are you not? Yeah. <laughs> I've had a nice line. I won't say who gave it to me. It's a national figure said this. We're involved in this bun fight at E&O. And this national figure put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Harry, I do enjoy these moments where you seamlessly transfer from being Norman Wisdom to James Cagney. And... <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, I'm quite happy to mess about. But, you know, if there's an issue, I'll take control of it and I'll run with it, uh, as I am with the e &O right now. Well, and uh, I, I wish you every success with that. And uh, yeah. we we will encourage everybody who listens to the Humorology podcast to actually support uh, your cause at the e and 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 uh, uh, make sure that they sign the petition. Um, I've heard you say that there's a growing understanding of the relationship and potential of the arts to promote health, prevent disease and accelerate uh, rehabilitation from illness. Does that include humour aiding resilience in that sense? I often say people used to get better long before doctors were invented. And I'll do a simple thing for you. Let's, let's do heart disease. Um, um, you may genetically be predisposed to heart disease, and that's that's the risk of life. You know, I often say it's important to choose your parents wisely. <laughs> On top of that, what could make your heart disease worse? Smoking, uh, being overweight, lack of exercise, poor sleep, stress. So these are very simple lifestyle factors. Now, there's lots of theories on, uh, on obesity. I mean, it's, again, uh, infectiously predisposed to All of us have been guilty for comfort eating, you know, when we're not feeling happy. And uh, you then will, will go for the second bacon sandwich or you'll clear, clear the cheesecake in the fridge. 
we've all been guilty when you've had a bad week of uh, opening that bottle of wine and finishing it. Uh, but if you were happy, you may not have eaten to excess, you may not have drunk to excess. Uh, and, of course, and if you can just get some, even however bad the situation is, if you can get some comedy out of it, uh, then you, you've got to find a way of coping. So um, it's if there is happiness and comedy, uh, I think it reduces the stress levels. There's loads of work being done on this. There's loads and loads of papers to do with uh, the, the fashionable expression is called social prescribing. You know, when you bring lifestyle factors into people's lives. Uh, and a lot of work has been done to see if you can actually cut down dependency on your doctor, dependency on the hospital, and dependency on drugs by actually correcting some of your lifestyle factors. Yeah, uh, well, I think Dr. Tim Sharp um, of the Australia's Happiness Institute um, they to say that humor, said something about humour being the core component in resiliency. And one reason for that is that it's about seeing things from a different perspective. And, and something that's something that all the best comedians do, isn't it? Yes, uh, but the juxtaposition of that, the comedians hopefully will make you happy because they make you laugh and they relax you. Um, but the amount of comics I've met, they're quite uptight. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, um, but the happiest, most successful people don't uh, just stop at one way of looking at things, is it, or, or a situation. They explore other ways, which is yeah. uh, using that component. By the way, both of us have known a lot of comics, and uh, I know um, what you're saying. And they can be tricksy, can't they? And uh, I've never been involved in more tension when you've got five comics on the same show. I mean, there used to be a TV series called The Comedian years ago, and these oh. six to go out on the road. My God, the fights were uh, uh, for, for nicking time, uh, pinching each other's material, uh, who went first, who went last, and all the rest of it. And unbelievable, really. It was four acts and a compare every night at the comedy store, um, yeah. two shows a night. Um, so I'm, I'm very aware of that one. But I yeah. love all of them dearly because I still think that they are doing the hardest job in the world and having been around it. I mean, if you think about it, or what comedy is and you do it and I've done it, what you're doing is making people do an involuntary act, do you know, yeah. And that's got to be the hardest thing and, and taking them on that journey and then giving them that huge dopamine hit that, yeah. that makes them feel great. I can tell you a, a current story. At the you know, um, during the crisis, we thought, how else can we help? So one of the problems of long COVID is uh, they don't breathe very well. They've got respiratory complications. They've got these inflammatory changes on the uh, internal anatomy of the lungs. So we can't reverse inflammatory changes, but most people don't breathe correctly. So when they were breathing with these inflamed lungs, uh, they were starting to affect their oxygen saturation. So we've got our singers that actually show them how to breathe better using the diaphragm, using the upper muscles here, lifting the, lifting the thorax. And um, it's proved, so therefore the underlying diseases that's still there, but their ability to maximize their capacity on their lungs has improved. So they're feeling better, systemically feeling better. They're feeling stronger and better oxygenated. So we've now got, we call it ENO Breathe, and we have 2,000 patients on the project around the country with 85 NHS trusts. We then did a trial in 2021 with Imperial College, and it's proved to be so successful it was published in The Lancet. Oh, uh, my and gosh. So it's hugely successful. So there is the art and one of the techniques of the arts, i.e. singing, uh, using your lungs. It's, it's probably a variation of physiotherapy, really. But we haven't, it's cost the NHS nothing. Uh, no, it's, it's meant less appointments to the GP. It's meant less hospitalizations. And that is just helping people maximize on what they have already. I will look up ENO Breathe and we will tell everybody about it. It's all, on, it's all on our website. All the years I was a doctor, I never published in The Lancet. Now I'm chairman of an opera company, I've published in The Lancet. This <laughs> <laughs> so what a wacko juxtaposition of that. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, 
Harry, we've reached the time in the show which um, where we like to go for quick fire questions. Quick fire questions. Harry, who is the funniest business person that you've met? And I should say that Arlene Phillips named you as the funniest <laughs> business person that she'd met. So uh, who would you give that mantle to? There was, who remained a friend, a chap who used to run the RAC called Eddie Ryan. He could make me laugh because he had liver puddling humour. So that's what just come. So Eddie will be very pleased with the name check. He's retired now, but he had liver puddling lines. Why is it that people from Liverpool, people from Glasgow, uh, have that rhythm, have that comedy? I think they're tough cities. My parents were from Glasgow. Uh, Liverpool, I mean, you shouldn't just focus on the Beatles. You've got to go way back to Arthur Askey and Frankie Vaughan. There's been loads of them have come from Liverpool. I'm bringing you right up to date with John Bishop, you know, and, and Jimmy Tarbug on the way. Lots of them. So out of adversity comes humour, yeah. do you think? Yeah, yeah. My yeah. mother's from yeah. the east end of Glasgow as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. the, yeah, I've done one quick fire and I've, I've distracted you. What's the next one? No. <laughs> well, what book makes you laugh? What book makes me laugh? Um, well, Adam Cage written books on medicine and I'm just slightly irritated that I should have done those. So Adam Cage's books are funny, but I'm rather irritated I didn't write them first. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> that's the right, uh, the right answer to that. No, but that's... My answer, I think. Oh, no, it's good. What film makes you laugh? A film I watch uh, repeatedly, time which I just... If I'm on a flight, uh, and it's not, uh, or if it happens to be on TV, it's not a question makes me... Well, it does make me laugh, because I enjoy it so much, uh, which I know this is not original, but I adore Casablanca. Uh, I know every scene of Casablanca, back to front. Um, I liked Funny Bones, which is why I mentioned it to you. There's a lot of showbiz and stick in that. Uh, what makes me laugh, I love some of the scenes in Scent of a Woman uh, with Al Pacino. Oh, yeah. that's I, He is really funny in that, isn't yeah. he? That's yeah, yeah. It. I've got every Marx Brothers movie going. I love some of the very old Road 2 films with Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Um, I love some of the stuff of Billy Crystal. Uh, yeah. His film. I saw one. The other, I saw a bit of what's it called? What's it called? Um, was it Blazing Saddles? What was the film called? Thirty years no, ago. No, no, no. It's not the Blazing City Saddles. Slick City Slickers. City Slickers. Yeah. City Slickers. And there's a scene where he's dressed up as a, a cavalry man in it with the, with the two sidekicks, and there's the Indian drums, and they're going dum 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 dum. This is only I only heard this line on Saturday, and the, the sidekick says, "I don't like the sound of those drums." And Billy Crystal says, it's not the regular drummer. <laughs> That's a real showbiz <laughs> line. Great showbiz and shit, you know. And he did another film I like, which makes me laugh, called Mr. Saturday Night. About yes, a big comic who, he did, you know, it again was tricksy, fell out of people, didn't behave himself, then became unemployable. Then ended up, you know, doing old, old people's homes and stuff. And, uh, and again, I know... I know lots of comics like that who had their moment, but they were just so tricky. I'm going to take a shift to the other side briefly now and ask you, what's not funny? Well, I think everything has the potential to be funny. It's what was it? Was it Lord Sorbin? You know, nothing matters very much and few things matter at all. And if you, if you can carry that mantra with you, I mean, uh, I find most things have not, I mean, board meetings, there's so much comedy and go goes on within in the rehearsal room. It, that's serious. I can see little bits going on, people's unhappiness, frustration. Uh, I mean, some of the horrendous things. And uh, I, there's nothing funny about the Ukrainian war, is there? You know, nothing at all. But you, the, the funny thing is that uh, we had John Sweeney, who is um, uh, reporting from there and who's based there now. And he said that the thing is that um, you do find funny things within that there, because that's a survival be, mechanism. It's like a medicine. I mean, um, I was the duty doctor the night of the Grand Hotel bomb blast back in 1984. And I looked after all those famous politicians. Um, you know, there is a sort of secret comedy between doctors even in moments like that really and uh, uh but when 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 
what you don't want of any any of the comedy which sometimes naturally appears you don't want it to sound unkind because it's not meant to be like that no and i think but I, it's sometimes just a a coping mechanism isn't it yeah. you know they talk about gallows humor it, it, it yeah. has to be there as a yeah. release yeah but everything is potentially funny if it's done with the right heart. Is that what, where you would go? Yeah, well, see, it was in, um, the bomb was 84, and in 1997, 33 years later, I was president of the Sussex Medical Society and I asked Norman Tebber to come and speak. And that was his first visit back. And he, I introduced him, he came out and he goes, thank you, Harry. And again, he had presence, he had presence about him. And he goes, he says, he says um, I trust the night will be less eventful than my last visit to Brighton. <laughs> oh, great and I, opening. I, that's a great opening line. And again, he, uh, he walked out well. People were pleased to see him back in Brighton. Uh, he had rehearsed that line uh, and it landed. And I just thought it was extremely professional. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and classy, really. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a classy line, sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, what word makes you laugh, Harry? Well, three words are currently making me laugh and cry, and that's the Arts Council England. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they cry and laugh in equal measure. Um, a word. Well, I, I, I well, let me do that. Um, uh, uh, Max Wall had a few of these. You know, uh, and he used to, that voice, splendid, and he had that <laughs> lovely way of uh, speaking. Uh, and he used to take the mickey out of the top, you know. Uh, uh, and he used to say to people, you know, did you enjoy my act? Go, oh, absolutely capital. And <laughs> he had lots of those things. He, 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 that was all from his comedy routine. Well, what a genius. What a genius. And 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 the thing, because I was going to ask you what sound makes you laugh, but it may be the sound of Max Wall's delivery. And good evening. <laughs> you know, and he had this wonderful voice. That opening was, good evening, the name's Max Wall. I'm one of the great balls of China. My father was a brick, you know, and that's and that I heard that night after night. Good evening, Max Wall here. I'm one of the great walls of China. My father was a brick. And I don't know what is funny about my father is a brick, but it got a laugh every night. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? That's well, going to be a very arrogant answer. I'm very happy to be considered both, actually. Well, I'll take that from you. Uh, but by the way, I always say that actually, uh, in order to be funny, you have to be clever. I've, I've very rarely met any comedian who isn't very sharp of, of mind. I mean, there's certainly a different uh, intellectual level. To be, I mean, if you take Jonathan Miller, who I knew well in his last few years, uh, a different intellectual level. But what they do have, all of them, depending on where they are on the sort of intelligence spectrum, uh, they have great awareness, uh, a great cunning, uh, a great sense. They, they all have that in common, really. And all of them, uh, uh, they all have one thing, whether you're a Northern Club comic or whether you're Peter Ustinov, they all had timing. They all had timing, all of them. And they just got it right. Okay. I mean, there's a big difference between Peter Ustinov and all those acts on the comedians. But, you know, we're going to go and see those comedians. Uh, they, they did time perfectly. It's, it's the one thing that you can't actually get. You either have it, you either hear it, and it's there. You know that Stephen Fry line? Did I try it on you? No. Uh, you, you asked me, what is the success of comedy, OK? OK. What is the success of Time. comedy? <laughs> <laughs> well, that takes us nicely to the last, uh, the, the last uh, question on the Humorology podcast, and that's desert island gags. You've known hundreds of gags over the years. You can only take one joke with you to a desert island. Yeah. What would that be? Gosh, I top my head. Um... I like the one about the two priests in the graveyard and one priest says the other says, Father, he says, if there's a burst of thunder, a flash of lightning, and the good Lord himself, Jesus Christ, suddenly appeared on that very tombstone right there in front of you, what would you do? And the other priest says, I'd look busy. <laughs> 
Oh, I, I've never heard that gag. That is a great gag and a perfect uh, way. You'll do it again. I got, I'll give you hundreds of them. Uh, I love the Max Wall gag. I, I, I used to say, uh, uh, this is an old gag, but he used to land it so well. And it says, the, last night I nearly lost my lovely lady wife. Pause. Look at the audience. What a card game that was. <laughs> Oh, that is absolutely brilliant. And you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you for the lightness. Thank you for the laughter. Harry Brunges, thank you very My, much for being a guest. I'm still available Humorology. for pantomime if anybody out there listening. The Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros, produced by David Rose, music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.